As I said earlier, I noticed we have some guests with us in the room. Thank you so much for being here to worship with us this morning. Amen. Amen. We're glad you chose to worship with us, whether you join us in person or join us online. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Uh, this morning. If I, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I go by Ant. I serve as the pastor here uh, at Midtown Two Notch. We're in the middle of a sermon series uh, through the book of Acts as we're looking at what it looks like for us to, to live as, as who Jesus called his disciples to be as his witnesses. What does this mean? What might this look like in our lives? What can we find from God's word that, that helps us as we seek to live this out? I want to start by sharing a story uh, with you. There's a pastor I know, his name is uh, Michael. He was just sharing recently with me uh, about a conversation he had with a man in a restaurant. He's sitting there, I believe it was with his family. And he's, uh, he, just, he just said, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, you need to talk to this man and encourage him uh, in Christ. And you know, you, you come up with all the reasons not to, uh, if that happens. But eventually he <laughs> goes to the man and he says, hey, I don't know what you believe about God or, any, or anything else. I just feel like God is telling me to let you know uh, that he loves you and that he sees you and that he cares about you. And he says, the man just broke down crying right there. He just broke down crying and said, that's exactly what I, what I needed to hear. I've been feeling so all alone. And he was able to share more and more about Jesus with this man right there in the restaurant. Throughout this series so far, the reality that God has sent his spirit to us to make us his witness, obviously has been an ongoing theme. We've seen it since chapter one. Today, I want to talk a little bit about following the guidance and the work of the Holy Spirit as witnesses of Christ. Today, we'll be looking at the story and the, the verses I just read. And in a little bit, we'll get to verse 26, where God leads Philip, this, this witness of Christ, to a place where there will be a wide open door for him to clearly share the good news of Jesus. And I'm trusting that God would use this passage in our lives today to one, open our eyes to the doors that he opens for us, and also to encourage and equip us to walk through those doors and clearly explain the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a little bit of context about uh, this pa particular passage before we get to verse 26. So if you remember last week, we talked about a man named Stephen. He stood for Christ. He was stoned for his stance for Christ. We talked about a man being there named Saul, what happened after Stephen's death was Saul continued to, to kind of lead this charge in persecuting Christians. And because of this intense persecution, the Christians fled from Jerusalem. They had been in Jerusalem primarily at this time, sharing the good news of Jesus. God had been growing the ministry there. And so they spread out. They spread out to Judea. They spread out to Samaria. And that's where Philip is, where we find him today. But you, I, I need to make sure we remember exactly what I said was the, the thesis of this book in the Bible, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where, he's, where Jesus tells them, you will be my witnesses in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he used that persecution to move his people outside of Jerusalem, outside of what was likely more comfortable for them, to the regions of Judea and Samaria. And today, as we look at this conversation between Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch, we see the first time in the book of Acts where we see the gospel movement go beyond Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem and to what Jesus called the ends of the earth. Let's look at verse 26 together. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert Place. So an angel, and that term just simply means messenger. Sometimes it's talking about the, the a being of heaven that comes and gives a message, but also that word in the Bible is used to refer to uh, others, just people who give messages as well. So an angel from God comes to Philip and it's like, no, okay, don't stay in Samaria. Take this road south of Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse 27, he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. So Philip does this, listens to what the messenger from God tells him. And he goes and he, there's a man who was a, tells us a few things about him. He's a court official of the queen of Ethiopia. He himself is an Ethiopian. He's in charge of all of her treasure, which means he's a, a man likely of very high status and very great importance. And also verse 27 tells us that this man was a eunuch which means, and I'll try to say this without being overly graphic, which means that he was a man that had been castrated. 
his, which is a procedure done in a man's private areas, among, which among other things keeps them from being able to have children. So this man would not have been able to have a family. It likely would have affected his countenance in some way as well. And if you want further info on that process, you're going to have to Google that because I'm already uncomfortable with it. But I will, I will say this. It, it is something that was likely done uh, to make sure nothing sexually inappropriate took place between him and the queen since he served so closely with the queen. That's likely what's going on here. Let's keep reading. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So this man had come to Jerusalem to worship God. Someone had told him something about God. Somehow, some way, he had heard about the true and living God, and now he had come to Jerusalem to worship this God. But this, this Ethiopian, he would have also had some amount of difficulty in that process. Because the main attraction in Jerusalem for those who come to worship is the temple. But one of the things about the temple and him being a eunuch is the eunuchs weren't allowed in the temple at that time. So this man had, had traveled to Jerusalem to worship God, to seek God, to know more about God, but he wasn't able to enter the temple to worship. And now he's headed back home on this road south of Jerusalem, which will take you to Ethiopia, where he was from. And it says at the end of verse 28 that he's reading the prophet Isaiah. Verse 29 continues on with this thought. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So the Holy Spirit is just like, go pull up on this man's chariot. And again, this is, this is somebody likely wealthy. Like not everybody's riding chariots at this point, right? Like not everybody's got a, got a chariot. Some people walking, a lot of people walking these days. My man riding a chariot and the spirit is like, go get in this man's chariot. Go hop in this man's chariot real quick. So verse 30, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to come up and sit with him now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? So essentially, if you're not familiar with the prophet Isaiah, this was a, a prophecy written over 700 years before Jesus' death that is about Jesus dying and why he died and what the purpose of that was. And you can just see the Holy Spirit is driving the mission forward. Don't miss that. That the Holy Spirit tells him to go to this chariot. And the Holy Spirit is, it's, I like to say, the Holy Spirit is the greatest missionary. He is sending Philip to this man, he's leading the way. He's calling the people of God to continue to spread the gospel through eternal, through external, excuse me, circumstances, specifically the persecution of the church and through speaking specifically to Philip. He's, he's led Philip to this man that has just traveled a long way to worship a God that he's still trying to understand, that he's still trying to figure out. And here's how the story concludes, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So this man becomes a believer in Jesus. I have three specific points I want to get to in a second that I think will help us in seeking to follow the Spirit's leading as we serve his, as his witnesses. But first, something I want to make sure I clarify Real quick, so this Ethiopian, this man of African heritage, is, is, the gent is the first Gentile that we see in the book of Acts become a follower of Jesus. And I think this is worth celebrating with, with great joy because here we see that the gospel of Jesus is for everyone. It's just as Jesus said was going to happen. He said, you're going to be in Jerusalem, then you're going to go to Judea and Samaria, then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. So no matter your background, no matter your creed, no matter what you've done, the gospel of Jesus is for you. Salvation from the kingdom of darkness, salvation from sin is for you. No matter your ethnic heritage, no matter your race. To my brothers and sisters of color in the room and those joining us online as well, there are some who would tell you that Christianity is the white man's religion and that it is only introduced to black people and other people of color as a means of oppressing black people. I'm here to tell you today, we see it in the word right here. We see it in the word at other places in the Bible right here. The first place that it goes after Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria is to Africa. Yeah. 
is the first place that it goes. The gospel is for everyone, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And one day we all will stand around the throne and see representatives from every tribe and every tongue and every nation worshiping our God. This is what Jesus promised will happen. And we get to see a beautiful story of how that begins to take place right here in Acts chapter 8. So the three points I want to make, and I'll be done today. Point number one, expect the Holy Spirit to prompt and use you. As far as takeaways from this passage, expect the Holy Spirit to prompt and use you. We see it here in Acts chapter 8. The Spirit's like, go talk to this man. And here's the thing by Philip. Philip wasn't one of the apostles. We see a little bit earlier, Philip was, was ordained as a leader in the church, but he was not one of the original 12 apostles. This was a faithful brother that they said, this man needs to be leading in the church. And we see God, we see the Holy Spirit directing him, leading him to this conversation that the Holy Spirit used to save this man for all eternity. Also, we'll get there later in the series. In Acts chapter 16, the Spirit guides the people of God, specifically Paul and those who are with him. And even the Holy Spirit was like, hey, they've already, at this point, they had already been to Asia and Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit was like, hey, don't preach here right now because the gospel needs to go across the Mediterranean Sea and into Macedonia. At this time, we see this happening, the Holy Spirit leading God's people. He's got people that he wants to save. He's seeking them out and he's leading and moving his people and guiding them to where they need to be. I remember one time in a conversation with a small group leader I had in, in college and we were talking about this idea and it's like, well, how do you know if it's the Holy Spirit that's leading and prompting you? Which is a great question, a great question. And he said, well, if you feel something in you telling you to, to share Christ with someone, it ain't the devil. And I can tell you who it ain't. <laughs> it ain't the devil telling you that. And listen, this isn't something that you can manufacture or make happen as far as the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And I'm not trying to tell you to manufacture that and make that happen. But I am saying that you can pray for God to open doors for you to bear witness about Christ. But I am saying that you can ask God to open your eyes to the doors that he has already opened to, opened to you. But I am saying that you can pray each morning and ask God to show you who he wants you to share Christ with today. This is one of the reasons if you're in one of our life groups that we have a review the, mix, review the mission section in your life group guide each and every week. We truly believe that God wants to work through you individually and through your life group to testify about Jesus. And we want you to spend time together praying for that. Who do you know that needs to, to, to know Christ that you want God to use you to change and save? You can come together and just, even if you just pray for them by name week in and week out. You can come together each week and pray for God to open doors for you all to testify about Jesus. You can pray that God will be at work in the lives of the people that you know. You can pray that God will direct you to the people that he desires you to share him with. You can do this individually and collectively in our life groups as well. I want to tell you a story and take you back to, uh, this is probably about uh, 2005. So I just joined a campus ministry. Uh, a lot of you, if you're members here, you, you, you might know uh, a brother named Anton, uh, who's one of our members here. So I knew Anton in college. We lived in the same dorm. And there was a, a, a guy by the name of Josh who also lived in our dorm uh, that I just felt the Holy Spirit was, was leading me to share Christ with. I just felt it over. I just felt this burden for it over. And it was just, I, no matter how much I tried to ignore it, I couldn't shake it. And I tried to ignore it because I ignored it because I was afraid. I was afraid to testify about who Christ is to this brother. And I remember seeing just some of the ways that he was living that was just against the word of God. Um, I remember specifically some of the ways I saw him talk to and even treat women that just made me think, this is a waste of my time to go and talk to this brother about Christ. But I would go to Anton's dorm room and ask for prayer over and over and over again for boldness to go and share Christ with this brother. So eventually one day I'm in the student center at the Russell House at, at USC and I see him and he's talking to some of his friends um, and it was like loud and, and it, was, it was just like, it felt like, you know, everyone there was having a good time, just laughing and stuff like that. And so at that time, I felt the Holy Spirit was saying, now, this is it, now. And I was like, man, come on, man, like interrupting the whole conversation, like what we doing? So I, I literally get up, walk over to the man, <laughs> walk over to him. Tap him on the shoulder. I mean, we knew each other a little bit. We lived in the same dorm, probably played video games together a couple of times. Uh, and was like, hey, can you talk for a minute? And he looked, he was like, yeah, okay. So we go over and talk, and I sit down, and I just, I was part of a ministry one time. We had this little book that we, use, we would use to share Christ with people. So I kind of went through that with him. Uh, and the whole time he was looking at me like this. 
I mean, eyebrows down the whole time. And I'm like, this is a waste of time, whatever. Um, when I'm done, he looks up at me. He's kind of nodding his head. And he was like, thank you so much for sharing this with me. He said, growing up, my grandma used to take me to church all the time. And I knew that I, I know that I'm not living the way God has called me to live. And I know that I'm supposed to because my grandma being faithful and taking me to church. Um, but this was something that I definitely needed to hear. So we were uh, about to, we had a, a Bible study that I was a part of at that time. And he, I asked him to join. And he, he I didn't seem super interested at that point. Uh, but a, a year or two later, so we're talking probably 2007, uh, 2006, 2007 at this point, uh, he sees me on campus. We're just passing by, you know, going to class. And he stops me. He's like, hey, are the Bible study still going? I want to I want to come. Can I come? And I was like, I was like, yeah, absolutely. He was, he was like, when did they start up? And I was like, well, probably a week or two. Anyway, we got contact information. He ends up showing up, bringing some of his friends with him. And in, the, in, this, in this small group that I was a part of, this Bible study, we, uh, it was just one day we were just trying to get to know each other a lot better, sharing things that are difficult for us, things that we're struggling with. And he's like leading the way. I mean, he's, he's like, he's the leader of the group. He's just sharing. And you can see him inviting his other friends to like share and participate. And they're doing the same thing. And it was, it was a really wonderful time, really wonderful time uh, in the Lord. And then um, I think it was later that year, uh, we, were, we were playing basketball and he was there uh, and he came up to me and he was like, hey, I, I want to know how to study the Bible more. Can you help me with that? Yeah. And so that was a Friday night. That next day, we were in my apartment for three hours, just Romans chapter three, justification by faith, how we are, we are, we are saved by faith in Jesus. Our works don't save us. Yes, God calls us to work for him and he's prepared works for us to do as his workmanship, but we are saved by grace through faith. And his mind was just getting blown. Like he, had, he had no clue. He had no clue that, that that's how one actually enters into a relationship uh, with, with, with Jesus. And I remember now, this conversation stood out to me. This was, uh, we're probably close to 2007 at this point. And uh, I see him in the student center again. And he's like, hey, I need your advice on something. And I was like, okay, cool. And he says, I got friends that I want them to know about Jesus. And it's so urgent to me that I want to say it to him every time I see him. He said, but I don't because I don't want to like be bugging them like every single time that I see them, but it's so urgent. He was like, what do I do? How, how, how do I share Christ with them? And I asked him, how is he sharing Christ with them now? And he did. And I was like, that's what I would do. <laughs> you're, you're doing exactly what I would do. But I noticed at that point, this man, this brother was so different. He was so, he had so been changed by the Lord that now he's trying to figure out how do I help them experience the same change that I have experienced at this point. And it was an incredible thing to see. And it, one of the things that I'm, that happened, I mean, that was 2007. I remember in 2008, and the story, the story takes a, a, very, a very sad turn. Um, it was in 2008 when I found out and I heard that he had cancer. Um, and he actually passed away in 2009. And I don't know exactly when he became a follower of Jesus. I do truly believe that the Holy Spirit stirred in my heart at that time to share Christ with him. And I truly believe that if we are open, if we are open to seeking the Lord, seeking him on who he might have us to bear witness to, who he might have us to testify to about Christ, that he will put it on our hearts oftentimes to share him with others. And sometimes I wonder if Josh's grandma knew. Sometimes I wonder if Josh's grandma knew that the, that the foundation that she laid just being faithful over and over and over again. No, you coming to church with me today. You coming to church with me next week. You coming to church with me the week after that. I wonder if she knew the foundation that was being laid such that when I share the gospel with him on campus, the first thing out of his mouth is the faithfulness of his grandmother. And the reason that I bring that up, because when I talk about the Holy Spirit prompting us, it's not just the conversations that are in the moment. Sometimes it changes someone's life. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is calling you to just be faithful over time. He's just calling you to continue to share Christ. He's, he's calling you to, con to continue to invite that person to church. He's calling parents in here. Continue sharing Christ with your, with your children at the dinner table. Continue bringing them to kid town so that they can hear over and over and over again about Jesus and who he is and what he is all about. And I would call us to remember in the text, this Ethiopian had heard about God already. Someone had already told him about the true and living God. He had a scroll of the, from the prophet Isaiah on his chariot with him as he is coming back from the place where he went to worship God. Someone had communicated to him the, the good news about God and that he should seek him 
And God used this conversation to change this man's life forever. Whether that be through bearing witness about Christ faithfully over time or whether it's through a few conversations here and there, let's be open to the Spirit leading and prompting us to bear witness about him to those around us. So we need to continue faithful in the things that we know God is calling us to. But I believe also sometimes we should get quiet before the Lord and ask God to help us to hear his voice as we pray. Ask God to to, to give us the joy of seeing him change someone's life through us. Ask him to lead us to someone who he is already working in, which is exactly what was the case with Philip. Point number two actually is exactly that. Look for evidence of God working in people's lives. Look for evidence of God working in people's lives. Philip goes up to this man. He's reading the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> Not only is he reading Isaiah, but he's reading, it, he's reading what's probably the clearest prophecy in the book of Isaiah about what Jesus had done and what Jesus came to do, who actually had died right there just outside of Jerusalem where he came from. It was obvious that God was working in this man's Life. There are times when you can see that God is working in someone. Maybe they're beginning to have questions about God. Maybe they're asking you for prayer about something, even though they're not actually a follower of Jesus. Maybe they're confiding in you about something and asking you about your thoughts and how you deal with different things you're going through. Maybe they're exploring other types of spirituality or philosophy, trying to find truth. Don't always assume people aren't open to hearing about God. Don't always assume people aren't open to hearing about God. I think as Christians, we often just assume people don't want to hear about Jesus. So we often won't even check to see if they're open to hearing about Jesus. We just assume we look at that person's life as I did. We look at that person's life and it's like, oh, this person is not interested in Jesus. If they were, they wouldn't be doing this. When the truth of the matter is you have the one thing, you know, the one person, you know, God himself who was able to change them. You know what their only hope is. It is in Christ alone if they're going to be changed, if they're going to be saved. And one of the ways, and this is just practical, you don't have to do it this way, but just maybe some some things that you can try of practical ways of trying to maybe gauge people's openness to Christ. You can do that maybe through passive, what I call passive conversation. Maybe you bring up, maybe you bring up your faith in conversation. You just bring it up just to see how they respond to it. Maybe you let people know that you've been praying for them. And see how they respond. Do they respond favorably to these things? Maybe you bring up how your faith in Jesus is a blessing to you just as you talk about your life. It's just passively bringing up in conversation. Or maybe through more active questions. Maybe you intentionally ask them about their beliefs. Do they have any type of spiritual or religious background? Or how do they deal with the difficulties of life? How do they feel about Christians? How do they feel about Jesus? How do they feel about the church? Maybe it's a way of gauging people's openness to Christ. Another way that you can do that is through intentional invitations. Maybe you invite them to hang out with your life group. Maybe your intentional invitation is you're inviting them to worship with us on a Sunday morning. We want to move in step with what the Spirit is doing. And sometimes it's obvious, like the case with Philip and the eunuch, but it's not always like that. Sometimes it's helpful to be intentional about seeing where people are as far as their receptivity to hearing about Christ. So the main point, I believe, of this text is about God using Philip, using the the, the persecution and the suffering of the Christians at that time to, to continue to make sure that the gospel is being spread, not just in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but even to the ends of the earth and specifically here to Ethiopia. I just want to be clear. I believe that is the main point of this text. But I also want to point out that I believe we see God using Philip's sensitivity to the work of the Holy Spirit to minister the gospel of Jesus to this Ethiopian man in a way that is very relevant and personal and special to this Ethiopian. I want to explain what I mean. See, this man, like I said earlier, was a eunuch, wasn't able to go to the temple to worship. But on his way back home, Philip told him about the one whose death caused the veil to be torn in the temple. Philip was able to tell him about the one who not only caused a veil to be torn in the temple, but through faith in him, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, our bodies now become the temple. Now, here's the thing. This man was not able to get into the temple because of something that had been done to his body, but now because of faith in Jesus, his body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God, which came to the people of God through the temple, is now inside of him. 
then not only does, does, does Philip answer this man's questions, but now the very thing that likely could have caused him to feel excluded, which is his body now has become the very temple of God. It now houses the very presence of God himself. You see, the gospel was presented to him via the sensitivity of Philip to the Holy Spirit in a way that was very personal and I believe very meaningful for him. This man who suffered under having his body mutilated is reading about a savior who can relate to him and his suffering that this man has endured. Let's look at what it says in verse 32. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opens not his mouth. He was reading about a savior that has suffered the mutilation of his body and, and the eunuch himself had experienced that same thing. He was reading about the very one who understood him more than anyone else because Jesus also was looked down upon him. They didn't want him in the temple and they even crucified him outside of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 33, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. God was using Philip's sensitivity to the spirit to share the good news of Jesus with someone in a very personal way. And I just can't help but wonder what God would do in and through us if we are open to the same thing. I can't help but wonder what he would do through our life groups and through our church if we continue on following in Philip's example. I wonder who who you know that God wants to meet in a very personal and relevant way. I wonder who is feeling unloved that God wants to share his love with. I wonder who is feeling downcast because they feel as though their life has no purpose, that God wants to uplift and infuse their life with the purpose that they were created for him, for his glory, that they might know him and be about the work of building his kingdom. Saints, in closing today, I want to go to my third point of a takeaway from this passage, and that is expect God to work even in difficult times. Expect God to work even in difficult times. I don't want us to miss the fact, something that I believe can fly under the radar in this passage, and that's that the context of this whole occurrence is is suffering and confusion and difficulty and pain. As I said earlier, this is likely a a time of grief for Philip as someone who was ordained as a leader in the church right alongside him at the same time as him had just been murdered, that the the church is being persecuted, that this tight-knit family that we talked about in Acts chapter 2, that we talked about in Acts chapter 4, and how much they shared everything together. Now they're all scattered away from each other. They're They're in different parts of the regions that are around them as they go about sharing Jesus. This is likely a very difficult time for them. This is likely a time of grief, and this is likely a time of difficulty for the eunuch as well. He had just come to Jerusalem so that he could worship God, and once again, he goes there. He's not allowed to enter into the temple, and there's a time of confusion. He's just reading the book of Isaiah, coming home on his way back to Ethiopia, not understanding what he is reading. This is a story of great pain, suffering, confusion, grief, trial, and difficulty. But it's a story about how God is greater than your pain, how God is greater than your suffering, how God is greater than your confusion, how God is greater than your trial, how God is greater than your grief, and how God is greater than your difficulty because he's, he's greater than all those things. And we see that because he's able to turn those things around right here in the middle of this story and use them for his glory and use them to bring salvation, not just, not just with, through Philip to this eunuch who was an Ethiopian, but we know that this, that this Ethiopian also went back home rejoicing because he had become a follower of Jesus and likely spreading the good news of Jesus in his home. And this is important for us to know because oftentimes when we're going through trial, oftentimes when we're going through difficulty, oftentimes when we're going through suffering, it causes us to have laser focus in on our situation. It causes us to focus in on what's going on with us and we miss the bigger picture of what God is doing, how God is still at work in us, how God is still at work around us because it consumes our minds and our thoughts and our hearts so often. But this is a story that shows that even in the middle of the difficulty, even in the middle of the pain, God can still be at work in you. God can still be at work through you. God can still use you to change someone else's life. Even as you pray and see God for change in your own life, God can use you to change someone else's life as well. Because he is greater than our pain. God is saying to us through this passage, I can use you on your best day and I can use you on your worst day. I can use you. I can use the confusion. I can use the suffering in your co-worker's life, in your family member's life. I can use all of it for my glory, for my good, because I'm greater than all of that. The death and resurrection of Jesus are powerful enough to change anyone's story 
through steadfast faithfulness day in and day out, and through a single conversation. What a Savior we serve. What a Savior we worship. May we be open to everything he wants to do in us and everything he wants to do through us.